Association. Are you cheering because it's the general session or because it's the last one? Ooh! I suspected as much. It was a, it was a stretch, squeezing lunch in between that great morning service. Uh, were you all here for that? And duly inspired? So you've been hearing multiple messages all week about the need to move into discernment and engagement. Uh, I like that wholly abrasive uh, a metaphor. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that on my own. I like it very much. A little more sobering, I wanted to um, talk about, and I can't now find my notes, on the um, West Virginia flooding. I, I said something earlier when we first convened, uh, but it has certainly got it, gotten much worse. And if they would screen up the, um, I have a slide that we prepared quickly overnight. Um, a lot of people have approached me on making uh, contributions, and um, this slide will tell you how you might want to do that um, directly to the congregation uh, or the uh, UC, UUC Clean Water Fund. Um, I haven't spent much time on the news, but it reports to me tell me it's devastating um, with the death count unknown in many places not excess. So keep them all in your prayers. Uh, I think it'll be days before we know the, the extent of the devastation. And for those of you driving home through West Virginia, a note that there are flood conditions in many places. So check with somebody, AAA or someone like that, to determine and make sure of your own safety going forward. And then I've also had queries about um, uh, the Orlando UUs, people wanting to make contributions to them, I don't have a slide for you, but simply go to their website, orlandouu.com, if you feel moved. .org, .org, orlandouu.org, uh, if you wish to help the good people of uh, the Orlando congregation who are doing incredible community work and community outreach. And, stretching their facilities and staff in that, in that process. That's okay. I know I've made you timid on applause, but that's okay. Um, and one last sort of interesting thing. Uh, a General Assembly in 1984, here in Columbus actually, the Assembly took the first vote on our current statement of principles and purposes. Uh, it was finally adopted um, the next year, in 85, in Atlanta, Georgia. Just wanted to um, shout out to the good folks of uh, Ohio that were, were, were back again and have had a great week of hospitality. Thank you. So, uh, I now call to order. I've called, done that. I, yesterday you voted to place three actions of immediate witness on today's agenda. Today we'll take up each of the three and according to the rules we adopted on Thursday, you will have 20 minutes of debate for each AIW. The mini-assembly to offer amendments was held yesterday. Uh, so let me first uh, turn to Susan Geckler, and then we'll have some, um, uh, some introductions as we do each AIW of how, what went on in that uh, session. So I think the uh, CSW includes the text and likeness. Thank you. Um, when you came in the hall, if you were a delegate, you were offered a CSW alert. It should also be on the GA app, and um, it is available for off-site delegates um, with their CSW alert off-site. That CSW alert has copies of the three uh, act proposed actions of immediate witness that you selected yesterday, along with some amendments that were proposed at the mini-assembly. We, the CSW reviewed the proposed amendments. We incorporated most of them. What you see in what you've printed out is if something is an underlined, that is something that was added as a result of the amendment process. If you see something with a strikeout, that is something that was taken out as a result of something at the amendment process during the mini-assembly. At the end of each of the uh, proposed AIWs, there are unincorporated amendments with line numbers. 
um, and with a little explanation after each as to why we made the decision as the CSW not to incorporate that particular rec recommended uh, amendment. Before I actually make the motion to put these into play, though, I would like to just make a comment, and that is I know that this morning um, the delegates uh, voted to suspend AIWs next year, and I want to assure this body that the CSW is supportive of changing the process. We're open to that. We're also open to exploring alternatives to ways that we can witness and act for social justice. We welcome your comments and suggestions for things that you would like to do either next year or in subsequent years. And you could offer such by going to socialwitness at uua.org. So with that, I now um, move to adopt item number one, which is build solidarity with our Muslim neighbors found in the CSW alert. It has been moved and seconded to adopt uh, CSWA, building solidarity with our Muslim neighbors. And is there a second? Of course there is. Thank you. The motion, before we go into the instructions, um, will the facilitator who did that mini assembly give us a little insight to what went on from the uh, amendment mic, please? Be a little easier access there. Hey, everybody. So, take off the glasses for this. So this morning, uh, I went to, to type up a synopsis about the action of immediate witness regarding the support of our Muslim neighbors. And apparently, I made a typo because spell check thought I had said, action of immediate wisdom. <laughs> I thought, hmm. Can we add this to our well, that, that can be easily That can witness? be easily fixed. We don't need to discuss that as an amendment. Okay, Just but, I, but I digress. I understand, moderator, um, <laughs> and I apologize. But I just want to say that our group of 30-ish delegates worked together reviewing the text of the AIW section by section. The group was serious and intentional about the spirit of the effort, graciously listening to one another. Delegates raised questions and collaborated on the language of the amendments with thoughtful leadership a couple of times. Differing opinions led to straw polls to test the mood of the room and to move forward in our work. And initially, discussion of the title of the action focused on emphasizing that Muslim people in our communities, are, our UU U congregations communities, uh, are our neighbors. We spent a bit of time uh, talking about how we would frame our grounding spirit to love our neighbors as ourselves, and eventually we were called to, um, called by a delegate that, to recognize that if we were not careful, we would spend all of our time on preambles and never get to the part where we call ourselves to action. So regarding the language of the AIW as written, one member called to our attention the problematic language by the wording of what peaceful and good people Muslims are, most Muslims are. And this delegate noted that as a white man he, and a UU, he's never called to point out that he's generally a good and peaceful person. It's assumed about him and that it would be helpful to have this, dele it was very helpful to have this delegate model anti-racist accountability in our group and it spoke to the care we took in our process. It is not necessary for us to state this about Muslim neighbors, our Muslim neighbors, to make this AIW worthy of our support. And after this, the group moved to refining and strengthening the action steps that were called for, recognizing our Muslims as our neighbors. It was suggested will call us to address the legislation, the very real uh, legislation that deals with the very real problems, the very prevalent harms that Muslim communities deal with every day, such as excessive surveillance and, and um, barriers to immigration. Thank you. Thank you. So let me go over the rules once again before I call on people at the microphone. 
The motion can only be amended by introducing amendments offered in the mini assembly, but which were not incorporated. You have those on the CSW alert. In other words, no new amendments from the floor today. And no amendment can be offered until 12 minutes of debate. The AW requires a majority, favor, a two thirds favorable majority to be adopted. But there must be 12 minutes of debate before delegate may move the previous question to call for a vote on the main motion. The motion to move the previous question uh, requires a uh, two thirds majority to require an immediate vote on the main motion. Same as we did this morning and yesterday. Um, so the chair reminds you all once again, if you want to speak in favor, uh, please speak, speak to the merits of the business, the, um, the AIW, and avoid injecting a personal note into the debate. Each speaker is limited to two minutes and may only speak once. So the delegates have two possible outcomes, approve it with a two-thirds vote or defeat it with more than one-third unfavorable vote. So now the chair recognizes the delegate at the pro microphone. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm Eric Hoffer from the Unitarian Universalist Church of Lexington, Kentucky, and also the uh, president of the board of the Mid-America Region. First of all, I want to reiterate that the mini-assembly process both refined and improved this AIW, and I thank the CSW for that. In this time of hate speech, and increased Islamophobia that is escalating into actual physical aggression. We need to let our Muslim neighbors know that we stand in solidarity with them. Standing on the side of love means engaging in resistance against hate. This AIW has impact. There are specific bullet point items in it that congregations can undertake. It also offers partnership opportunities for interfaith action. A lot of congregations don't know how to take that first step, how to go across the street to their Muslim neighbors and engage. This AIW is that knock on the door for them. It's a way of saying, I stand here in solidarity with you. Let us work together. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Well, seeing no one at the con mic, I'll return again to the pro mic and I will recognize the delegate at the pro microphone. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm Cynthia Landrum. I'm the ministerial delegate from the church in Clark Lake, Michigan. And I also want to echo my support for this AIW and my thanks to the CSW for their work in helping us um, bring it into our full, the fullness of our real intentions. I'm the one who added the language to this um, from, from our group process, I added the language in lines 14 and 15 that were struck, and I fully support that because I added that language out of my own Islamophobia and my own fear. It was my fear that this General Assembly would need people to say that, well, peaceful Muslims we support. And I'm so pleased to see that we're striking that language to say that we don't need to have fear in the way we stand with our Muslim neighbors. So I urge this assembly to pass this AIW without any amendments taken out or added in. Those of us who were involved in this mini assembly and those of us who authored and co-authored this resolution, this, this AIW, are in support of the language as it is now. Thank you. Thank you. Again, I'll go to the pro microphone and recognize the delegate there. Thank you. My name is Danny Reb, and I am the delegate from the First Unitarian Universalist of Detroit and also a resident of Dearborn, Michigan, the location of the largest Middle Eastern community in the United States. I speak in favor of this motion because the bullet points listed in it will be, uh, will provide direction towards our congregations in regards to actions they may take. One often does not know where to start, and this resolution provides a clear roadmap. Thank you. Thank you. So once again, I go to the pro microphone and acknowledge I, I, the delegate at the pro. I am, I hope I'm not doing this too loud. I am Sarah Wade Smith from the Allegheny Unitarian Universalist Church of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I am urging you to support this action of immediate witness 
on behalf of my martial arts instructor and African American Muslim and my many Muslim friends. America has a long and proud tradition of religious diversity and tolerance, but like so many of our best traditions, it is a checkered one. Over the centuries, we have seen many outbreaks of anti-Catholicism, anti-Semitism, the murderous persecution of Mormons. It is a tradition that is always being challenged and never perhaps more so than today when a rabid evangelical movement would like to ban all non-Christian religions. This is our chance to stand against that and to stand for our basic principles by supporting a community that is facing persecution. Most Muslims, well, I'm obviously saying the obvious, most Muslims have nothing to do with the accusations of terrorism. They deserve our support. And also, if we do not stand against this, many people who are not Muslims, but who are of Middle Eastern origin, will find themselves being persecuted because they are perceived as Muslims, whether they are or not. It's a simple choice between America's best traditions and America's worst traditions, and I'm asking you to stand for America's best tradition. Thank you. Again, I um, go to the delegate at the pro microphone. Thank you. My name is Alyssa Goss. I'm from University Unitarian in Seattle. And I just would like to share my enthusiastic support for this, resolu for this action of immediate witness. Um, in particular, I would like to lift up and affirm um, lines 23 through 26, especially around the xenophobia with the increased ban on immigration and increased and unnecessary surveillance of our Muslim neighbors. We see this coming in a lot of our state legislatures on our city councils. And this is a action of immediate witness, not a witness on immediate witness. And I think how we can take action is really looking at the bills that are coming into our communities and really bear um, and speak to the Islamophobia that is spreading. And we need to take action on that. And also like to lift up and affirm proactively advocate against Islamophobic bills and actions, paying particular attention to the surveillance as listed under actions in this. And I think that's what makes this resolution so powerful. Thank you. Thank you. And the moderator recognizes the delegate at the pro microphone. Good afternoon, moderator. I'm Jackie C. Williams of the Albany UU congregation in New York State. I rise to speak and support this and especially because of, it may sound a little bit, well, however it sounds, the fact that in referring to Muslims and a lot of information about Syria and some of the particular attacks, one of the concerns is that some people have a difficult time recognizing that there are international Muslims and American Muslims. Very often, the black and brown people who converted while incarcerated are among the American Muslims that sometimes use a different mosque. So when our Unitarian Universalist congregations are reaching out, we need to make sure that we, that we reach out to all Muslims in the area and those who were formerly incarcerated are being oppressed doubly, triply, quadruply for their race, for their incarceration status, and for their religion. So I just urge in looking at this resolution that we look and we do build on the references to inherent worth and dignity of every person, and when we're referring to all Muslims, regardless of national origin. Thank you. The chair recognizes the delegate at the pro microphone. It's moving pretty fast there. I'm Rachel Hayes from the Fourth Universalist Society in the city of New York, and I am speaking to this um, AIW in recognition of the Muslims who are not only our near neighbors, but are among our own ranks. We have our Muslim UUs who are part of our body, and we love them and need to support them just as much as our neighbors that we're reaching out to. We need to hold the Muslims in our own midst. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And thanks for everybody's succinctness. The chair recognizes the delegate at the pro microphone. 
I'm Betty McGarvey Crowley from the UU Church of Annapolis, and I'm also on the board of the UU Legislative Ministry of Maryland. And I want to compliment the, uh, the writers of this resolution and the ones who redrafted it. I'm very proud for us to have this. And as a legislative person, I am particularly pleased to have lines 52 through 54. This is something that we can all implement in our congregations, our legislative ministries. So thank you. Thank you. And the chair recognizes the delegate at the pro microphone. Thank I'm you. I'm getting a crick in my neck. Thank you. Doris Marlin, All Souls Church, Washington, D.C. I would like to speak on behalf of this action of immediate witness um, and, and call everyone's attention to um, a story that one of my Muslim friends has told me that recently in California and probably in other parts of the U.S., there has been a movement toward asking our Muslim brothers and sisters to identify themselves and actually wear something identifying themselves as Muslims. And my, my Muslim friend was horrified by this because she identified the parallels to, um, well, pre-World War II Germany efforts, which was shocking. And not only did that story shock me, but also um, in a recent visit to the Civil and Human Rights Museum in Atlanta, there were like five actions that um, you need to be on the lookout for that identify steps towards, um, um, well, basically genocide. And one of those was marking individuals in a particular, of a particular group that is one of the steps that leads towards that. So let's not go there. Let's be friends with our Muslim brothers and sisters and take this by, by, take this bull by the horns and reverse this inhumanity. Thank you very much. Theoretically, we have, I think, one more minute for a debate, but this doesn't seem to be much of a debate. Am I getting a sense that you all are ready to vote? Yes. All right. Those in favor of voting on this main motion as amended in the AIW with no unincorporated min amendments to consider, please raise your voting card. Oh, I think I know how this is going to turn out. Lower your card. Those opposed? The AIW clearly passes. It seems almost unanimous to me, so congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> You all do good work. Um, I'm going to call on uh, Susan Geckler once again to um, put the motion in for the second CSW. Thank you. The Commission on Social Witness moves to adopt proposed action of immediate witness B, some guns, all guns, legislating appropriate restrictions. So it is in move. Is there a second? Indeed, there is. Could I now call on the facilitator of that AIW to uh, tell us uh, what went on there? The facilitator of the AIW? AIW discussion on guns was very, very energetic. I think any discussion on guns would be energetic, very spirited, and I was impressed in facilitating that particular session with the knowledge that the people, the delegates in the room came up with as they talked about the text that is in front of you. We did in working beyond that particular session, discover that we too had an editing challenge. I think uh, Jim called it a kerfuffle. And I've asked that it be put up on the screen in lines 31 through 35 in that paragraph 
the wording should have read, policies such as expanding background checks to cover all gun sales would help keep guns out of the hands of those already deemed illegal purchasers. And that was what was intended, and in typing it late last night, we, we missed it. What I found as I worked with this group was such dedication, and I'm sure that there were probably more people, but you were all interested in your other areas. What I also shared with a few of the delegates was that I, as a person, lost a son to gun violence. Thank you. Now, do we understand this, the, uh, the handout you have, uh, Some Guns, All Guns, um, Action of Immediate Witness B, on line 32, as he, it has been amended by the mini assembly, and it's just a typographical error that they left in the phrase. So you're debating and ultimately voting on that line 32, which will read the hands of those already deemed illegal purchasers. Are we clear with that one? Seems like we are. So, the uh, motion has been um, uh, uh, made and seconded and explained, so I'll go to the pro microphone and recognize the delegate there. Thank you. Kimberly Holdridge, First Unitarian Church of Orlando, Florida. Every day on average, 297 people in the U.S. are shot in murders, assaults, suicides, suicide attempts, and unintentional shootings. Every day, 90 people die from gun violence. Millions of guns are sold every year in no question, no questions asked transactions. The death tolls change, but the memorial photos change the most. The one thing that's the common denominator is the weapon. Virginia Tech, the home of Susie 2015, 32 students were killed. Sandy Hook, the Washington Navy Yard, Charleston Church, the Recruiting Center, Umpqua Community College, and the Orlando Pulse Nightclub. Policies such as expanding background checks to cover all gun sales would help keep guns out of the hands of criminals, felons, domestic abusers, and other illegal purchasers. Background checks are supported by 90% of Americans, including the vast majority of gun owners, because they make us safer. Since 1994, the Brady Law itself has blocked over 2.4 million prohibited gun purchases. As Unitarian Universalists, we affirm the worth and dignity of all people and justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. These regulations will not finish the task of building the world we dream of, but they will keep numerable people safe as we continue to work to address broader issues of mental health care, hate rhetoric, and cultural violence. I hope you'll support this AIW. It's, we brought it to you thoughtfully. We dealt with other members of our community in nonprofit groups that are nonpartisan. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I recognize the delegate at the pro microphone. Thank you. Hello, I'm Danny Slater, Director of Religious Education at Buckman Bridge Unitarian Universalist Church in Jacksonville, Florida. The attack on the Pulse robbed young adults in our congregation who were studying at Valencia College of four classmates and friends. Further, it took feelings of safety from our LGBTQ congregants and replaced them with those of fear. On the 13th, one of those congregants began to text me. I'm terrified, Danny, they said. I think there will be more copycats. We are an easy target. This has hit my family harder than I thought it would. Love is powerful, but people with guns take lives. We spoke a bit more, and I ended her conversation by telling her I had her back. And I meant it, but it is not enough, not nearly enough. 
For though I can comfort their fear, I cannot remove it. What I can do and what I ask you to do is to join the fight to get the types of weapons that feed their fear off the streets. We can add our voices to the cry to end the sell of assault weapons. We can demand a safer community for those we love because camps, schools, and sanctuaries should not have to do active shooter trainings, because vigilance cannot combat a bullet, because there is violence in the hearts of the hurting and our friends are the targets. Let us witness together that even one more gun death is unacceptable. Together, we have a mighty voice. Let us shout so loud that Congress hears us. Thank you. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the con microphone. Thank you. Um, I'm Elizabeth Mount. I'm with the First Unitarian Society of Denver, Colorado. And I live just north of Columbine. I was in high school during that shooting. And I want to say that because I think it's important to note that the diversity of ideas around gun violence do not come from people who have not experienced the terror of gun violence. But I know, I know from my own experience that when we use comprehensive background checks, when we advocate for guns to be only in the hands of the military and the federal government, when we declare that some people are irredeemable as felons and should never have access to any sort of weaponry, we are not making a universalist statement in accordance with our principles or our aspirations, and we are further marginalizing the very people who we just claimed in our last action of immediate witness that we wanted not to continue to marginalize. The use of comprehensive background checks and the advocating of that endangers and further marginalizes people who are Muslim, people who are queer and not white and not well protected. We often forget this. And while I sincerely hope that we will work to end gun violence and to restrict access to guns, I cannot support an action of immediate witness that does that through the use of further background Thank checks. Thank you. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the pro microphone. Imagine with me for a moment that you're in a park playing with a group of young children and one child has a stick, a stick that is being used to hit and harm the other children. How would you solve this problem? Would you give all of the children sticks? I'm guessing that you would take the stick away. My name is Regina Nobby, and I'm from First Unitarian Church of Orlando, and I never imagined that gun violence would come so close to me, to my city, to my LGBT community, to my friends, and even to my sister, who was at the Pulse Club during the shooting. The news refers to this as the latest shooting, and latest because we've become blind and immune to the issue of gun violence. Since two weeks ago, when the Orlando tragedy happened, another 1,170 people have died from gun violence. Statistically speaking, that's 90 people a day. At my church, I serve as the DRE, and last Sunday, we brought in grief counselors to speak to the children. And what I saw on the faces of the children and heard in their young voices was fear fear of going to a restaurant and going to a nightclub maybe someday. They're afraid to go back to school and they're afraid to go to their church, a place that is sacred and is their safe place. They're afraid to go to their church. And what does our future look like if we're afraid to go out into public? And so I ask you, when is enough enough? If 90 deaths a day isn't enough, what is? 
how much blood has to spill before we consider having a conversation about taking away the stick. The sticks that are shooting 13 bullets per second. Let's just have the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. The chair recognizes the delegate at the pro microphone. I'm Charlotte Fleming of the First Unitarian Church of Orlando. Our city has been through shock and horror. The echoes of it still reverberate and will for some time. The man who invaded the Pulse nightclub, shooting over 100 people and killing 49, carried an automatic assault weapon. He had purchased it less than a week before. That weapon should not have been available to him for any reason. We as a UU community can do something about this. We can create a groundswell of people in our communities who agree that assault weapons have no place in our states and nation. We can elect candidates who can and will stand up to the NRA and their lobbyists. We can put this issue in front of the people and keep it there with letters to our newspapers and our representatives at all levels and the corporations and wealthy people who fund the gun industry and the NRA. We can talk to our families and friends and strangers to educate and motivate them to do something about guns. We are not helpless. We can make a difference to protect the children, women, and men of our communities, of our states, and of our nation with our efforts. We can make it so. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the pro microphone. Thank you. My name is Denise Holdridge. I'm also from the First Unitarian Church of Orlando and an employee with the city of Orlando. The early morning hours of June 12th brought unimaginable change to our community. First responders walked among the dead, searching for the living. Instead of the silence following a mass shooting, they were met with the sounds of cell phones ringing and text messages going unanswered. Families and friends desperately searching, trying to find their loved ones. Above them, the disco ball continued to spin and cast an eerie light in the club. These are images that those first responders will never forget. Gradually came the task of reuniting families with the wounded and the slow process of notifying next of kin. 49 dead because one young man was able to purchase an assault rifle meant solely for the act he carried out. Will you please join me in supporting this action of immediate witness? This happened in Orlando, but could have easily happened anywhere in America. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I recognize the delegate at the pro mic. I'm sorry, I didn't see this over here. I've gotten so accustomed to looking to my left. I recognize the delegate at the con microphone. Hello, I'm Brianne Bird from East Shore UU. Um, I didn't expect to find myself up here, but the previous con speaker raises a very good point. We are jumping to um, pass this AIW to protect the GLBT community. But how many of our queer community and also the disabled community um, have been labeled felons for things that are not actually crimes or people have been labeled as having mental illnesses and being unsafe when they aren't? We need to keep that in mind with the background check um, portion and the way that we legislate this. Thank you. I believe we have someone, the, we have time now, we're in the time period where we can entertain amendments. Is there someone at the amendment mic wishing to make an amendment? I recognize that delegate at the amendment mic. Thank you. I'm David Overton of First UU Church of Austin, Texas. I'd like to suggest that we amend the AIW to incorporate uh, Amendment E. The AIW is written on line 11, bans sale and manufacture of assault weapons only for civilians. And I think our intent is that we would not want uh, licensed gun dealers to sell um, assault-type weapons also. 
there are 130,000 federally licensed gun dealers in the United States, and I think our intent is that it would be a crime for them to sell assault weapons as well. Thank you. Is there a second to this amendment? I hear no second. No, there's a second. I see it. I see it. Thank you. All right. So now we're debating the uh, am suggested amendment that has been put in play. Is there anybody who wants to speak in favor of this amendment? Is there anyone who wishes to speak opposed? Are we ready to consider this amendment? So the amendment, you're getting ready to vote on whether to add this amendment to the uh, AIW that we've been discussing. All in favor of adding the amendment, raise your card. Thank you. Opposed? Let me check, but I think I'm clear on it. We all agree that the amendment passes, so we're now back. No, we have another amendment to consider. I recognize the delegate at the amendment microphone. Thank you. Sally Gellert, Central Unitarian, Paramus, New Jersey. I would like to uh, move that we include uh, unincorporated amendment G, replacing in civilian hands within our communities. Uh, similar rationale, uh, the commission thought it was vague, but I intentionally broadened it because in particular, in New Jersey, we have had an issue where police are getting militarized, um, in, in our case, a tank that was fought off by the ACLU, but we're concerned about those weapons being anywhere near civilians, no matter whose hands they're in. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a second? Raise a card somewhere. Yeah, I see several se seconds. Thank you. So now we can debate the amendment. Is there anybody who wants to speak in favor of this amendment beyond what we've heard? Anyone opposed? Are we ready to vote on whether to incorporate this amendment? I think we are. All those in favor of incorporating the amendment? Please don't yell at me. If you have something, come to the procedures mic, and I see that someone's coming. You're going over to the negative microphone. I recognize the delegate at the con microphone on this amendment. Thank you. Erin uh, White from Fourth Universalist, New York City. Sorry, I have a sprained ankle, so I can only run so fast. Um, I uh, am opposed to this uh, amendment, as I explained in the mini-assembly, because while I agree that the militarization of our police force is a problem in our society, I think that it is too large of a problem to include within the scope of this current uh, AIW. I think it's an entirely different issue that would need much further study and clarification. Thank you. Seeing no one else at the uh, pro and con microphones, I think we're ready to vote on whether to incorporate this amendment. Those in favor of incorporating this amendment, raise your hand. Uh, raise your card. G. Amendment G, excuse me, Amendment G, line 16. Those in favor of adding, uh, replacing the language in 16, raise your card whether you like this amendment, hands down. Those opposed, the amendment fails. Thank you. Um, do we have any mic, the amendment mic teller? Not yet. We have someone at the amendment mic, and I recognize you. Thank you. I'd like to introduce or uh, propose. My name is Patrick State. I'm from Vista, California. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, amendment B. Furthermore, we support the dialogue with lobbying institutions such as the NRA and encourage research on this, on this issue. Tell me again the line number. I didn't follow you. Uh, line 30. It goes uh, right after the end of the, um, of the, of the paragraph. Um, just can, you, can you give me the letter of the amendment? That, on the, on B. The D? B, as in boy. Boy, thank you. So, do I have a second for that? We do. Um, so what we're discussing now is whether to add and buy gun ownership from anyone on the no-fly list of having a history of mental illness. No, no. B. B. Sorry, sorry. I don't know my letters anymore. Furthermore, add, we line 30, line 30, add, furthermore, we support dialogue with lobbying institutions such as the NRA and encourage research on this issue. 
Does anybody want to speak at the pro microphone for this? Is there anyone at the con microphone that wishes to speak to this? Er yes, Aaron White, a fourth university. Could, you, could we get the mic? I recognize the delegate at the con microphone. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Aaron White, Fourth Universalist, New York City. Um, as I spoke in the mini assembly regarding this, um, again, this is another one of those issues uh, where, first, I, I think supporting dialogue is rather vague in terms of what does that mean, um, and second, also the issue of the, the NRA and whether to take them on on this issue and the fact that research um, into this is currently banned by federal legislation um, in accordance with you know, lost something that the NRA has lobbied for. So while I think that, um, yes, we should take on that issue, I agree with the commission um, that this is not meeting the criteria of immediacy and uh, would take away from the overall action of immediate witness. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone that wants to speak in favor of this amendment? Excuse me. Pardon me, Teller. I recognize the delegate at the procedure microphone. Uh, point of personal pr privilege, I think it's improper. My name is Lloyd Dent. I'm from the Onion, the Sepulveda United, uh, you know, UU Church in Northridge, California. Um, there seems to be some consternation when uh, you simply uh, state, are you ready to have a vote on this amendment without specifying the number and the wording. It, it was briefly. So noted. You're right. So noted. Thank you. Thank you. So I recognize the delegate at the pro microphone. Hello, I'm Patrick State from Vista, California. <clears throat> on the amendment, um, there is currently legislation prohibiting research on gun violence by the federal government. This is unlawful. This is something that you use should stand up against, and we should incorporate this um, idea of, in, of the need for research into our, uh, our, wor our, our verbiage. Um, and also, uh, and we, when we were you know, looking at some of the challenges that face the change of, uh, of gun violence in America, the NRA is an important and, email, and um, an important part of, the, of that process, and uh, we need to somehow either, in our best, most loving way, talk to them and not condemn them. Thank you very much. Noting no one at the con microphone, I go to the delegate at the pro microphone. Hi, I'm Jeff. Oh. Excuse me, I apologize. I recognize the delegate at the procedure microphone. My name is Carolina Cravart Graham. I'm from the Church of the Larger Fellowship. I would like to call the question. The question has been called. Is there a second? Thank you very much. So the question has been called, which would end debate if you support this call, the original question, uh, by a, a margin of two thirds. So on the amendment, I'm sorry. Uh, so we're trying to call the question on this amendment, uh, which is line B of the unincorporated amendments to add, furthermore, we support dialogue with lobbying institutions such as the NRA and encourage research on this issue. All those in favor of this um, amendment, raise your cards. Of cl calling the question, I'm sorry. Calling the question, yes. Opposed? Thank you. So the question is called and debate on that uh, amendment is closed. So now we return, we don't have any other amendments to consider, so now we return to the debate. I got it, I got it. I'm trying to get ahead of myself. All those in favor of incorporating this amendment into uh, action of immediate witness B, some guns, all guns, legislating appropriate restrictions, please raise your card in favor. Thank you. Opposed? Clearly, this amendment fails. Thank you very much. So, having disposed of that amendment, let us then return to the debate on the main motion. And I go to a procedures microphone. I recognize the delegate at procedures microphone. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. My name is Jim Carvart Graham from the Church of the Larger Fellowship, and I'd like to call a question on the main motion. Question has been called. Is there a second? This means, this means that if uh, this vote passes, uh, we, will we will vote then on the main motion. 
So all those in favor of calling the question? Thank you. Those opposed? We clearly have called the question, so we are now ready to vote on the main motion. Are you ready to vote on the main motion? All those in favor, raise your cards. Opposed? The motion clearly passage, passes, and this action of immediate witness is adopted. Thank you. Thank you for that. The um, motion to adopt CSWF, Stop the Hate, Protecting and Support Our Transgender and Gender Nonconforming Family, um, has um, — Susan, are you going to make it? Before I make this final motion, I would like to acknowledge that in addition to the many assemblies that were held on site, and we have been hearing from the facilitators of those sites, we did have a separate mini assembly for the off site delegates. And they did engage with all three of these issues. They proposed amendments. Their amendments were also uh, in, uh, included in the discussion and considered, as were the ones for the on site delegates. And my understanding from the uh, commissioner who facilitated that was that. Uh, that they were very engaged, um, had a lot of good ideas, and a lot of good energy around all three of these issues. The Commission on Social Witness moves to adopt action, uh, proposed action of immediate witness F, found in the CSW alert, stop the hate, protect and support our transgender and gender nonconforming family. Having heard the motion uh, to pass this uh, AIW to stop the hate, protect and support our transgender and gender nonconforming family, and having heard a second, it is so moved and we are ready for debate. But we have an, um, we have four, I'm, I'm confused. Ah, you're going to tell us what went on in the CSW. I like it. I like it. Tell us what went on there. I recognize the delegate at the amendment microphone. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. My name is the Reverend Caitlin Cotter, and I am delighted to talk to you about what happened in our mini assembly. Like the other mini assemblies, we found that we had an amazingly thoughtful and careful discussion of this issue. And more than that, we had fun together, engaging in this process, joking, laughing, and even dancing. Yes, there was dancing in <laughs> our excitement for this action of immediate witness. As you can see, reading through this AIW, most of the suggested changes are about making it more inclusive and strengthening the language. Those in the room felt the original proposal didn't go far enough in indicating just how perilous the lives of our transgender and gender nonconforming friends and family are. Um, those in the room did take out some small things. You'll notice as you look through the text, um, such as the reference to the seventh principle, which people in the room felt didn't add significantly and, in fact, potentially weakened just a touch the action of immediate witness. They did suggest two major additions to the actions of immediate witness, which you will see under the unincorporated amendments. Those two um, suggestions weren't included because the AIW felt that we didn't have the authority to add such major chunks of text, and that would rest in the authority of the delegates in this room. Thank you. Thank you for that. So we're ready to have our debate. I recognize the delegate at the pro microphone. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I am Vanstrom Dracul from UU Fellowship of DeKalb, Illinois. I support this AIW because I am a transgender man. This is not a choice, nor a silly choice. My only decision was to be true to myself. Since I started transition in 2013, I was concerned for my safety. But after unjust bathroom laws, and especially the shooting in Orlando, I do not feel safe in this country anymore. Put yourself in my shoes and imagine this, because we, go, we can go through a lot of violence. I go into a men's 
restroom just to do my business peacefully. So far, I am another white man, but heaven forbid someone discovers I'm transgender. Instantly, I become just a piece of meat, less than human, an object someone else feels entitled to use for his own pleasure. Disabled and having health conditions that render me physically weak, I am defenseless. Can I trust authorities to help me after those bathroom laws? Of course not. I'll be the one to be blamed and put on trial instead of the attacker. Our first principle applies to all without exception. As Ellie Lieb's song titled Post says, I shouldn't have to live where I stand. I shouldn't change who I am to count as a human. When will we, the transgender and non-conforming, uh, gender non-conforming people, will start counting as human? Thank you. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the pro microphone. Thank you. Um, okay. I am Sarah Wade Smith from Allegheny Unitarian Universalist Church in Pittsburgh. And I am a transgendered woman, which means I am directly affected by the ongoing waves of discrimination against transgendered people. Some of you may have the blessing of not knowing about a holiday, if I can call it that, that we have in the transgender community. The day of remembrance, when we gather every year to commemorate <coughs> those transgendered men and women who have been killed in hate crimes over the last year. It's almost never less than 50. Because we are different, People think that they have the right to commit violence against us. People think that they have the right to deny us the right to live, a place to live. These bathroom bills are, words cannot express my rage at this. It's basically the root of all oppression, which is taking a small marginalized group, making them the other, and then legitimizing violence against them. Not only do we have these laws being passed, we have Southern politicians actually boasting about how if they see a transgendered woman using the bathroom, they will beat her up or shoot her. We need to stand against this. We need to stand for the right that I thought was enshrined in the Declaration of Independence that everyone, without exception, had the right to life, to liberty, and to the pursuit of their own happiness. I am asking for your support. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the procedure microphone. Steve Hollingsworth, Unitarian Universalist Church of Chattanooga. I'm here to move to suspend the rules for the purpose of substituting for the word family, the word siblings in the title the, of... You're, you're out of order, sir. I'm sorry. I, I'm, so, I, I'm sorry. Thank you. Why, why am I Thank out of Thank you. Order? The amendments go over here and they can't be inserted unless they are unincorporated. Thank you. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the pro microphone. Thank you. My name is Linda Fingerson. I'm a member at the Unitarian Church of Sharon, Massachusetts. Living in Massachusetts, I had the great pleasure of lobbying in support of a bill extending public accommodations rights to transgender and gender nonconforming people. These bills are commonly known as bathroom bills, but that politicized, biased interpretation masks was a, is in fact a very simple concept, that a trans person who already has the right under law to work at, say, a Dunkin' Donuts or to drive a bus for the MBTA should also have the right under law to be served a donut and a coffee without being chucked out of the restaurant and to get on a bus and ride in peace. That simple. The fight was incredibly hard in Massachusetts. It is not over, but it will be tougher elsewhere. On one of the legislative visits, the congressman with whom we met revealed that his office had received phone calls on the passage of the public accommodations bill at a ratio of 200 calls against to every one single call for the bill. The other side is that well organized and they are experts at the manufacture of unfounded fears. During those visits to the State House, I learned that 
I am not now, myself, the typical advocate for trans and gender nonconforming people's rights, but rather that many of you all are. I am not married. I don't have children. I have no trans people who are immediately members of my family. At the level of lawmaking, it is, however, family members working hand in hand with trans people who are changing the perception of this fight on a visceral level for the general population. It is the families who live in fear of losing their gender nonconforming loved ones to the scourge of suicide and hate crimes that are now speaking out on behalf of their children especially and also in immeasurable grief for trans and gender nonconforming people of color who are at the greatest risk and whose names we must say and say and say. Are we ready to answer empathetically and passionately? Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's take a breath here, and then I'll recognize the delegate at the procedures microphone. And I would remind folks that we do have um, chaplains in the house if you feel your anger rising or having your being triggered in any way. So I recognize the delegate at the procedures microphone. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm with the Reverend Lynn Marshall from the Unitarian Universalist Church of Concord, New Hampshire. And I've noticed that our off-site delegate votes have been showing on the screen, but as we vote, we have, there has been no mention of their participation. Th and thank you. And I thank you for drawing it to my attention. And um, I have a little tool here that tells me if there's anybody wishing to be in the pro or con or procedural, so I'm interacting with them in that way. So they've been participating. It would be good for us to be reminded they're participating. Thank you. My parliamentarian and I have uh, counseled here, and the gentleman at the procedures microphone that I ruled out of order, uh, apparently I misunderstood what he was trying to say, and he wants to move to suspend the rules regarding um, not admitting um, other amendments into this discussion. So the rules as stated now, the amendment time and period has closed. Uh, and we're debating the main motion. So uh, I need someone to move to suspend the rules. Aye. <laughs> there's, a, there's a move and a second. Is that what you want to speak to, sir? I, I had thought I had correctly stated my motion before, which the parliamentarian has, uh, has, has given me, which was I move to suspend the rules for the specific and sole purpose of substituting the word siblings for the word family, at which point... And I apologize. I misunderstood your, that yes. it was a motion and thought you were trying to introduce an amendment. So now we have a motion to suspend the rules relative to amendments to see if we want to consider another amendment. for the sole purpose of making a motion to bring in one more amendment. Is there a motion to do that? Have you, you've made the motion. Is there a second to do that? So are we ready to vote on suspending this specific rule to allow one amendment to come in? Ready to vote on that? Those in favor of suspending the rule for a few moments to advance one amendment, raise your card. Thank you. Hands down. Those opposed? Clearly, the um, amendment, to the, the motion to suspend the rules <coughs> fails, and we can move on to where we are in the debate. And I will recognize the delegate at the pro microphone. Brianne Bird from East Shore UU Church in Kirtland, Ohio. I speak here today as the wife of a gender fluid partner and the stepmom of a 12 year old little girl who will proudly tell you she has a transgender sibling who is her favorite person in the world. I speak today to amplify the voices of us messy queers and our allies that call our church home. 
I seek to lift up other voices who cannot be here today but still desperately need this AIW as an act of faith from this assembly. Just yesterday during the session, a transgender woman was challenged while trying to enter a bathroom right here. She endured the pain and emotional violence of being misgendered in a state that has not even yet passed a bathroom bill. These laws, along with any more that may pass, are just that, a state-directed act of violence perpetrated on a population already living under the constant threat of violence, discrimination, police brutality, and murder. These statistics are rising. The urgent need for us to stand against this hatred is the definition of what an AIW is for and is central to every principle we teach. This week also, a hate group chose to protest us because we support GLBTIQ rights. We responded by standing together in an act of love that made me proud to be a UU. I challenge you today to stand together again to counter hate with love. I challenge us all to draw a line in the sand and recognize that if we, as a faith, claim to support the dignity and rights of all people across the entire spectrum of gender, we cannot stand by and choose to not be the voice within our churches and greater world fighting against this oppression. I ask you to see that we cannot refuse to take this first step and believe that we are living any kind of covenantal or beloved relationship with our gender diverse members and ministers in our own churches, let alone a wider world. I implore you to make sure someday, never again, will I feel the pain in my heart that appeared when listening to a speaker on gender identity asked if they feel there is hope for them within our churches, and I heard the hesitation in their answer. We cannot create sanctuary or justice with our own, within our own spaces if we are not willing to stand with them in the greater world. Thank you. Do we have, um, do we have someone at the amendment mic? Do we have an amendment to make at the amendment mic? I recognize the delegate at the amendment mic. Angela Bridgman, UU Peace Fellowship, Raleigh, North Carolina, and one of the sponsors of this AIW. I'm calling unincorporated amendment A, inserting after line 39, pledge to educate ourselves and our faith and civic communities in order to provide ever safer, more inclusive, and potentially healing spaces for transgender and gender nonconforming people. My reasons for calling the specific amendment, and because this came out of the mini assembly that we had, which was a very positive and moving experience for us, I might add, is that several LGBTIQ people, myself included, have had negative experiences because we are LGBTIQ right here at this very general assembly. I will also say that this was not the fault of the UUA or of General Assembly or any UUs, but we have had these negative experiences and it has become clear to me that we do need to educate ourselves so that we can also educate others. I also wish to point out that the Right Relations team did a fabulous job with dealing with these situations, but the point is the situations should never have happened in the first place and we need to further educate ourselves as well as others. Thank you. Thank you. So the amendment that you're now considering is inserting after line 39, um, the group of text that I hope we can screen up, but it's on your handout, pledge to educate ourselves and our faith and civic communities in order to provide ever safer, more inclusive, and potentially healing spaces for transgender and gender non-conforming people. Is there a second? There is a second. So we're now debating uh, whether to add this uh, amendment so I'd go to the pro microphone and recognize the delegate there. I'm Carolina Kavari Graham from Church of the Larger Fellowship. Um, I was one of the team of people who crafted this in the General Assembly. Um, they say that all justice work is internal work. And the mood in the room at the time was that we really, really do need to look within and we do need to look in the mirror because of the experiences that our LGBTQ IA um, family have told us about in this space. So I was a little surprised, honestly, that we took that out. I see in the rest of the statement, we are educating all of those people out there. I hear precious little about us educating us here now. I ask that you support this amendment. Thank you. Does anyone else at the pro microphone? wish to speak in favor of this amendment, I recognize the delegate at the pro microphone. Yes, my name is Reverend Fred Hammond, uh, minister at the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Tuscaloosa, Alabama. 
and I'm speaking in favor of this amendment because I know the importance of this type of education. We had a member of our congregation who was in transition and we needed to do education of our congregation before they came out. And it was very, very important and affirming to that individual that we did that work. And I urge you to pass this amendment. Thank you. Are there others who wish to speak in favor of this amendment? I recognize the delegate at the pro mic. Hello, my name is Rebecca Keller Scholl. I'm the delegate from Needham, Massachusetts, and I was the one who was at the mini assembly and proposed that we include educate ourselves for a very specific reason. When I attended the Portland General Assembly, I went to a mini assembly that was on, if I recall, funding election practices. I anticipated it to be a rather boring session because that's just not my thing, but I went as a good delegate. And what happened was a friendly amendment was put forth to withdraw, withdraw gender inclusive language and replace it with binary gender language. And rather than a discussion happening that was uplifting and affirming of all people, it broke down to a conversation on grammar. Mm. This is not a conversation on grammar. As the parent of a transgender non-binary child, I continue to educate myself every single day the education doesn't end. We can't go out and educate others if we're not willing to educate ourselves. And we have a lot of work to do. So I urge you to include this amendment. Thank you. And it's my understanding the only reason that it wasn't incorporated was that it was a large chunk of text. And the CSW team thought that it needed to be fully exposed here in the general session. I recognize the delegate at the procedures mic. Hi, I'm Linda Sanders from First Unitarian Church of Wilmington. And I'd like to call the question. Is there on a second? This amendment. Okay, we well, you know what we're doing now. We're, if we vote in favor of calling the question, we are shutting off debate of this amendment and can proceed to vote on the amendment. So, all in favor of calling the question, please raise your cards. Thank you very much. I think I know the answer. Those opposed? The question is called. The debate on whether a further debate on this amendment is now closed, and we are now ready to vote on whether to accept the amendment. So, those in favor of accepting this amendment, raise your card. Oh, easy peasy. Thank you. Hands down. Those opposed? Right. Okay. The amendment passes, and we're all good with this. Excellent. So, now we have another amendment. I um, recognize the delegate at the amendment microphone. Reverend Dr. Michelle Walsh from Affiliate Community Minister from United First Parish Church in Quincy. I move to incorporate unincorporated amendment B, um, pledge to educate social workers and educators about transgender and gender nonconforming people's needs. Thank you. Is there a second? There is a second. So we now are talking in favor or against the uh, uh, unincorporated amendment B to insert after line 39, pledge to educate social workers and educators about transgender and gender nonconforming people's needs. So I recognize the delegate at the pro microphone to speak in favor of this. Okay, back over here, Reverend Dr. Michelle Walsh from United First Parish Church in Quincy. While I am a minister, I am also a clinical social worker. I know that there is a tremendous need to continue to educate social workers in this area, as well as other educators. I'm very ignorant still in this area. This is a huge learning area for me, even though I am a social worker. Social work schools vary in their commitments on this issue, particularly if the social work schools are religiously affiliated in any way, which many are. So I do believe that this is something that is significant that we need to recognize. Social workers are at the forefront clinically of working with people and engaging in social justice work. We need to be out there on this issue as well as the other issues. Thank you. Thank you. And this is another one of those amendments that had broad support in the mini assembly, but uh, the um, CSW didn't fe felt like it was a, a, lot of, a lot of text that the full, full assembly should consider. Looks like we're ready to vote on this amendment. Sorry, there's a con. I'm sorry. I recognize the delegate at the con microphone. 
Vanessa Burchell from Butman Bridge Unitarian Universalist Church in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, I'm actually going to go against this one because I am a licensed mental health counselor in the state of Florida, and I'm wondering how we can go out and educate others when we still are not educated. So who's supposed to be doing the education to the social workers and the educators if we don't really know what we're doing yet? So I think that we have to kind of hold the brakes. We want to do too much. So first, let's focus on what we need to do, and then we could be able to go out and educate others once we have a good idea about what they actually need to know. Thank you. So anyone speak, wants to speak in, at the pro microphone? I think you've, have you not spoken on this issue? I can't remember, I see you so often. <laughs> I, know. I recognize the delegate at the, very friendly oh. comment. I recognize the delegate at the pro microphone. So, I'm Carolina Kravarik Graham from the Church of the Larger Fellowship. I should just like wear a hat or something. Um, the, one of the reasons, and I, I, I really want to say I appreciate that comment, and I am a big educate yourself before you think you can educate somebody else, but we have quite a few people listed, quite a few, we have law enforcement and health professionals, et cetera, listed, and this was um, inclusive when we, when we did this. We wanted to include social workers as well because they were social service providers. Um, I feel like I don't want to leave them out. <laughs> Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the pro mic. Excuse me. Sorry. I recognize the delegate at the procedure mic. I just have a question. John Cowley from Sioux City, Iowa Unitarian Church. Looking at A and B, and I'm mm -hmm. not arguing about yes or no, you've got to rewrite the sentences if you put those in the same place. Well, it'll be perfected once, depending on what gets, what gets included or not, until, so it's good grammar and well, well punctuated. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the con microphone. Hi, my name is Lori Albright. I'm from the First Unitarian Church of Cleveland, and I am complete support of ne the need for the education of um, social workers and other people. However, to think that Unitarian Universalists are going to take on that job seems, I think that it would be good if it were worded to advocate for social workers being educated in this area it would be fabulous, but as it stands, it doesn't seem like something that we want to take on the responsibility for. Thank you for that. That would require an amendment, which is, would be out of order because it wasn't discussed in the many assemblies, so therefore isn't on the unincorporated. I recognize the delegate at the pro microphone. Angela Bridgman, UU Peace Fellowship, Raleigh, North Carolina. The Amendment B came out of our mini assembly as a direct response to HB, 8, HB 1840 in Tennessee, which allows medical professionals and social workers to turn away LGBT people if it goes against their religious beliefs and allows them to even inform LGBT people of why they are refusing to treat them, which is hurting people who are already hurt. I also wish to point out that the amendment does not say we are necessarily going to educate social workers and educators, but that we pledge to do so, which means we can pledge to do so when we ourselves are educated and able to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much. I recognize the delegate at the pro microphone. Procedural. Sorry. I recognize the delegate at the procedure microphone. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Danny Reb, First Unitarian Universalist Church of Detroit. I move to call the question on this amendment. Is there a second? If this, uh, this will require a vote, and those in favor of it means shutting down the debate. So all those in favor of calling the question, thank you very much. Opposed? The call of the question um, succeeds, and we can now go back to debating the amendment. No, 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 no. Where are we? Huh? We're still on B. We're still on B. Does anybody wish to speak in favor or against it? No, we've called the question. So those in favor of this, adding this amendment, on line uh, B, inserting after line 39, pledge to educate social workers and educators about transgender and gender nonconforming people's needs. All in favor, please raise your card. Easy answer. Thank you. Those opposed? The amendment passes.
We can now return, I think, with time. We have time to uh, rec another amendment. <laughs> I recognize the delegate at the amendment, Mike. Uh, Marcus Foliano from the UU Church of Peoria, Illinois. Um, I'd like to call to incorporate the unincorporated amendment uh, D, line 36, inserting the definition of uh, Fairness Act, um, because Fairness Act is very specific to local uh, states. Uh, other states, it's the Equality Act, so I think the definition being there is very important. It also is the only time that uh, gender expression would be included in this resolution. Thank you. Is there a second to that amendment? There is. So this amendment that we'll now um, vote in favor or uh, against is on line 36, inserting the definition of the Fairness Act, and there's a fairly lengthy addition there. Commission on Social Witness did not incorporate that because it offers legal interpretation. So I'll go to the, first the pro microphone, uh, the, I'm sorry, I'm going to go to the con first and have you speak. Yeah, uh, Sally Gellert, Central mm -hmm. Unitarian, Paramus, New Jersey. Um, I am not opposing necessarily the sense of this amendment, but I think that it was covered by the additions to line 36 and 37. Uh, the, the extra sentence says typically what it will do, which is you know, a speculation, a legal interpretation that I can see why it was left out. I do understand the concern for including the word gender expression and... You know, Thank you very much. I go to the pro microphone and recognize the delegate there. I'm sorry? The motion's out of time. The debate is over. We are out of time. Thank you, but I have a question at the procedure mic. Um, given the state, the Jay Clemmy, Worcester, Ohio, uh, UU, uh, if legal ish aspect is why UUA thought it should not be included, could UU a legal comment on what's meant by that. Would you like to comment on that? No. Uh, this was a CSW, uh, this was a CSW uh, decision to leave it out because it was a legal interpretation. I have a, someone at the procedures mic. I recognize the delegate there. Hi, my name is Tim Atkins. I'm a UUA trustee. I make a motion to expend, extend debate by two minutes so the maker of the amendment has a chance to speak pro. There's a motion to extend by two minutes. Is there a second to that? Is there a second for that? Now, those in favor of extending the vote by two minutes, raise your card. Those opposed, a lovely courtesy to offer. Thank you for offering that. So let's go back to the, uh, <laughs> you get your 10,000 steps in on your Fitbit today? <laughs> Absolutely. I recognize um, the delegate at the pro microphone. Thank you. Uh, Marcus Foliano, UU Church of Peoria, Illinois. Um, as I had mentioned, uh, the reason that I would like this amendment to be included is uh, the the use of Fairness Act is used specifically in states where uh, the word equality doesn't really fit. Uh, it's not very popular. Um, so having the definition of what the Fairness Act is uh, gives us the ability to also advocate for equality acts. The national uh, law is actually called the Equality Act. It is not the Fairness Act. And uh, the other point was um, that it, this is the only point that gender expression would be included in the definition, uh, in this uh, resolution. So we have uh, three different uh, things here, sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. So no matter what your gender identity is, no matter what your sexual orientation is, you can have a completely different gender expression. And that is something that you can also be discriminated against. So it's very important that the, that is included in this resolution. Thank you. So we are out of time, and we are ready to vote. I rec I think we're ready to vote. On the amendment. On the amendment, yes. <laughs> and what we're voting on is to uh, include amendment, unincorporated amendment D, line 36, inserting the definition of the Fairness Act. And in... Uh, consideration of your time. I think you can read that on the document. Are we okay with that? All in favor of uh, approving this amendment, please raise your cards. Thank you. Opposed? The amendment passes and is incorporated into the document. Now, are we ready to return to the main motion and vote on this amendment as amended? The AIW. 
Uh, I go, I have a delegate at the procedures microphone. Jim Kravark, Graham from the Church of the Larger Fellowship. I'd like to call the question on the main Thank motion. you. The question has been called. Is there a second? There is a second. So now we're voting on whether, the, whether we want to vote immediately after this vote. Those in favor of calling the question, raise your card. Thank you. Opposed? The question is called, and we are now ready to vote on the CSWF, Stop Hate, Protect and Support Our Transgender and Gender Nonconforming Family, as amended in this general session. Those in favor, raise your card. Thank you. Opposed? The motion, the AIW clearly passes. Thank you all for the spirited debate and the courtesies extended to one another. I very much appreciate it. So, are you ready to sing after that? So I'm going to bring back our um, GA music coordinator who's sprinting to the stage. All right. That was great to hear all the conversation. I think you're probably all ready to stand up and stretch and sing. I have with me Leon Burke from Elliott Chapel in Kirkwood, Missouri. And I have with me Cecilia Hayes from West Seattle. Those of you who were in Portland last year remember Cecilia singing for Sunday morning worship. And she's up here with us. And we're going to do a little Now Let Us Sing. Leon's going to lead off the low voices, and I'm just going to turn Cecilia loose on the top part. Be ready on the fourth verse, because we're going to drop into a little Spanish. You'll see the words up there. And I think we're going to let Leon start it. Are we ready? Now let us sing. Sing to the power of the faith within. Now let us sing. Sing to the power of the faith within. Lift up your voice. Lift up your voice. That got our juices going. Thank you, musicians. I'm going to bring back uh, Mary Catherine Morn, Director of Stewardship and Development, because I'm going to give away some stuff. Hello, GA. We are so grateful to all of you faithful, committed, and generous Unitarian Universalists who have, in the last few days, contributed over 246,714 dollars to our faith and the values we support in all of our collections. We're not finished counting. You are generous, committed people, and we thank you.
I also want to thank the hundreds of you who entered the To Be a Friend drawing and made a gift to Friends of the UUA and to our a special thank you to our matching donors who committed $20,000 to be a friend. Thank you for your support during this GA and throughout the year for your support for our association. So we will be selecting winners of the Be a Friend drawing right now. If you're here and we call your name, we invite you to come forward so we can talk with you. Otherwise, we'll be in touch with the winners. Our third prize winner will receive registration to General Assembly 2017 and a lovely New Orleans gift basket. Jim, would you please draw a name? Is this the one with the beignets? Yes. <laughs> Okay. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Okay. Emily Burr, Canterbury, New Hampshire. Are you present? Come on forward if you're present. And congratulations. Now our second prize winner will receive two registrations to GA 2017 and a gift basket. And the winner is? That's not a winner. Those are blanks. Those are blanks. They were blank. They were blank. They were blank. You're going to have to trust the moderator. Sally Beth Shore, Asheville, North Carolina. Ooh. Finally, our grand prize winner will receive two registrations to GA 2017, hotel accommodations for four nights in New Orleans, and a fabulous gift basket. And our winner is Janelle Hill from Golden Valley. Yes? Congratulations to our three winners and many thanks to all of you who participated. Thank you for being a friend of our UUA. Thank you, Mary Catherine. And um, the UU College of Social Justice was jointly launched by the UUA and UUSC at Justice GA in Phoenix in 2012 as a new way to inspire and sustain effective faith-based action for justice. Its experiential learning programs include immersion journeys, high school justice programs, young adult trainings and internships, and skilled volunteer placements. Please welcome Reverend Kathleen T., the director of UU College of Social Justice to tell us more. Hello, you stalwart souls who are still here. The big idea at the heart of the College of Social Justice is experiential learning. This is the idea that says that when we step out of our usual comfort zones, we can be startled into new insight and understanding. We connect in alliance and solidarity with people whose lives may be very different from our own, but who we suddenly recognize as family. And when it's family whose lives are at stake, we become more bold and creative in our action for justice than we might have ever dreamed possible. UUCSJ has developed four program areas. First, our version of service learning programs is built on the assumption that the most important service we render happens once we return home in newly inspired and informed action for justice. We ran nine such pilgrimages this year to Haiti, Nicaragua, Arizona, and the Lummi Nation in Washington State. Second, our one-week high school youth program, Activate, offers youth an intensive introduction to organizing skills and change theory, and a chance to anchor this learning in a particular struggle. We have offered Activate in Boston, focused on climate justice, Tucson, on immigration justice, and New Orleans on racial justice. Third, 
We have some amazing programs for young adults, college age and older. In collaboration with the Youth and Young Adult Office of the UUA and Standing on the Side of Love, our program, Grow Racial Justice, will bring over 30 young adults together next month in New Orleans, half of them white and half of them people of color, to do intensive racial identity work as separate cadres and then come together for a day of organizing skills and strategizing. Fifteen other young adults will join us in summer-long internships with grassroots organizations all over the United States and in India. These interns spend their summer in a deep immersion, learning about social change in a particular context. This is a tremendous opportunity for young adults who are just beginning to imagine themselves into the vocations that are calling to them. The fourth arena we've built out this year are skilled volunteer placements with partner organizations in the U.S. and abroad. For example, a UUSC partner called Raices in San Antonio, Texas, offers legal help to refugee women and children fleeing violence in Central America. This is a human rights catastrophe on our border, largely invisible. For the second year, we have organized groups of volunteers who speak Spanish or have legal training to partner with Raices for a week or longer in this life-saving work. Last year, 18 people answered this call. This year, we organized 24 volunteers who came from all over the U.S. to put their skills to work for justice on our border. And here, I want to give a huge shout out to the First Unitarian Universalist Church of San Antonio, over there, whose members, following a single meeting, opened their homes to house all 24 volunteers. San Antonio, you use rock. All of the programs that I've described are supported by deep learning before, during, and after the experience, and by spiritual reflection and grounding. Most important, they all point us toward powerful, sustained action at home. We hope you'll join us. UUCSJ.org has all of our programs. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Last year, the YA at GA talks were very popular, and today we have Elizabeth Mount to give us a taste of this year's offerings. I want to tell you that Elizabeth is on the reimagining, uh, reimagining uh, covenant uh, task force, and it's been very helpful to us. Elizabeth? Thanks, young adults. <laughs> um, hi, my name's Elizabeth Mount. I'm a member of the UU Young Adults for Climate Justice, um, and I'm also a community organizer with the Commit to Respond campaign, which is beyond the UUA. It's a collaboration of actually several different inside and outside the UUA organizations on behalf of Unitarian Universalism. And about this time last year, I became part of a Greenpeace team um, called to hang off of the St. John's Bridge in Portland, Oregon to stop Arctic drilling. We were part of a much larger campaign, the Shell No campaign, uh, working collaboratively with local groups, with indigenous groups, and with grassroots campaigns. Many of you, I hope, are also involved or considering collaboration with such groups in your own communities. If you are, 
I want to thank you. Because raised as a Unitarian Universalist, I am called, I am part of a faith that asks me to affirm and promote our values, to live out our belief in the interconnected web of all existence, defending the integrity of our planet. And I, this has never been more present than when I swung out over the edge of that bridge. I went over the edge in the middle of the night and saw the stars in the sky reflected in the headlamps of kayakers below me on the water, and every individual one of those lights showed me the power of people as connected to the vastness of the universe entwined and embodied in that place. Young adults, I think, are especially keenly aware that we have reached a point where the hope of avoiding climate change and climate chaos is gone. Whatever chance we had to keep things on this planet the way that they were, it's over. We can no longer sustain a steady growth economy because we have run out of planet. Changes must be made. It sounds frightening, but take courage. It is a time of action and creativity, because if the only option is to change, then that makes us free to try many new and creative things. Now is a time for liberation. Now is a time for dreams of interdependence. Now we can reset our expectations from the greed of global capitalism to new sharing economies driven by mutuality and generosity. Young adults know, we know that the systems we grow up in won't work to create a sustainable world. We need action, bodies on the line. We need financial and material supporters of all kinds and all ca capabilities. Even if you don't see the crisis yet, know that affected communities, frontline communities, are calling for your solidarity. Divestment, which we did two years ago, was a start. We can do more. We will do more. Let us be people of faith anchored in our values, ready to take action. The time is now to be brave together. Don't wait. I'm not going to say see you in New Orleans. I do want to see you there. But I want to see you before that. I want to see you everywhere. I'll see you everywhere. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, this is the time in our agenda where we entertain responsive resolutions. And we don't know whether we have any until I look at my email uh, at 6 p.m. on uh, Saturday night, according to the rules, rule 10, actually that you pa we passed on um, uh, Thursday morning. So could we open up the amendment microphone and the makers of this business resolution um, introduce it? It was handed out, I believe, was it not? It's on the GA app as well. I don't have one in front of me, but... Uh, So, I recognize the uh, delegate at the amendment microphone, or the delegates. Hi, I'm Eli Bradford from the uh, Westside Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Seattle. 
We as a religion have acknowledged that we support the Black Lives Matter movement with the passage of the AIW last year. This has done very little as to our attitude towards people of color. Voices of color continue to be marginalized and spoken over and for in our churches. All of our activism has been comfortable and required very little personal work or sacrifice for white people. Our job as a faith is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. We have failed majorly on both regards. I am using we pronouns, but I'm only including myself as a function of UU society. It is not the job of people of color to fix the world's racism problems, considering that most of our modern world was built on our backs and continues to actively work to suppress and oppress us. You whites have self-congratulated a lot for people who had a significant amount of trouble passing the Black Lives Matter AIW. The public witness, well, private witness, was supposed to be a public statement of our faith, but instead you all gave yourselves a big pat on the back for solving racism. Guess what? Racism hasn't been solved. You tell us that the system isn't working against us, but you wouldn't call this a system if it wasn't working. Anthony Ragler. We are all accountable for all of our past words and actions. The Black Lives Matter AIW general session was used to hurt black and other POC instead of working towards progress. This was a further symptom of your continued oppression of people of color. We are calling on the UUA Board of Trustees to issue a multi-level report on responses to Black Lives Matter at the next three general assemblies. You put us in leadership as tokens and don't listen to our voices. Well, here we are. Langston Hughes said, Negroes, sweet and docile, meek, humble, and kind. Beware the day they change their mind. Thank you. I'm guessing there's a second out there. I hear many seconds. Clearly this has a great deal of support. And we have 30 minutes to debate it. Or we can do something by acclamation. Um, is there any desire to debate it? Well, I do recognize the delegate at the pro microphone. Yes. Um, Angela Bridgman, UU Peace Fellowship, Raleigh, North Carolina. I just want to express my support for this responsive resolution. As a proud citizen of Raleigh and a proud transgender person who has marched with Dr. Barber many times in Raleigh in Black Lives Matter marches, in his HK on J marches, which is historic thousands on Jones marches, I have stood shoulder to shoulder with the Black Lives Matter movement. As a transgender person who often has to live my life in fear, I stand solidly with my African American brothers and sisters who also have to live in fear and should not have to. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a serious question. Is there an appetite in this hall for um, acclamation, or would you like to hear more discussion on it? I hear an acclamation. So we, all those in favor of doing this, uh, this business resolution without further discussion and with great enthusiasm and acclamation, raise the card. There's an objection. There's an objection. We want to talk about it. That's okay. That's what democracy is all about. So I recognize the uh, delegate at the pro microphone. Um, I'm requesting permission to speak as a co-author of this uh, resolution and also as someone with expert knowledge. Thank you. Okay. Um, my name is Allie Butler Cordova. I'm with the First Unitarian Society of Madison. Um, as a faith, we have acknowledged and affirmed our backing of the Black Lives Matter movement with the passing of the AIW last year. However, the passage of this AIW has seemed to equate to success in our anti-racism efforts as Unitarian Universalists to many individuals. But we have not succeeded. Our work has not ended. It has only begun. Our activism for this movement does not start with hanging up a banner outside our congregations and end with the passage of the Black Lives Matter AIW. When you use have to hold witness to our own attempts at advocacy and pat ourselves on the back for their allyship, this is not support. When you use of color are recruited as a token minority on congregational committees, this is not support. When you use think that signing a check and throwing a bill in the offering means that we showed up for Black Lives of UU and that accomplishing that means we're done with this activism, this is not support. When you use encourage each other to stay woke yet vote against the CSAI for the national conversation on race, this is not support. When you use can praise the way a person of color preaches at the podium, but the message calling us as a faith to action flies over their heads, this is not support. 
When UUs need constant reassurance that their well-meaning intentions overrule impact or lack thereof, this does not support. General Assembly in Columbus reeks of unproductive white guilt rather than white discomfort, which UUs desperately need to sit with. Once our faith has sat with this and let it seep into our hearts, we can move away from the de discussions to the action we so desperately need. We cannot call ourselves a radically progressive faith we think we are when we refuse to prioritize the marginalized and oppressed voices of color, specifically black ones, within our faith. We cannot claim to honor the inherent worth and dignity of every person when our faith has barely scratched the surface of what we call anti-racism work. Thank you. Thank you. I recognize, do we have someone at the procedures mic? I recognize the delegate at the procedures mic. Specialer than me. <laughs> Are we being polite out there? I'm Carolina Cravari Graham from Church of the Larger Fellowship, and I hope this is the last time I'm here. Um, I have heard a lot of great supporting statements for the AIWs. I believe that this is a very important thing, and I would like to know how is it that I can make it, or I can ask you that we would hear more. I am sure that there is more to oh, hear. Oh, we can do this. We yeah. can do this. Thank you. Thank you. I recognize the, de the other delegate at the procedures right. mic. Danny Davidoff from uh, Unitarian Church in Westport. Uh, you know, I'm sitting here, Jim, thinking, as I look out at so many of those beautiful faces who I am privileged to know, that this is a really good example of, of how our reinforced uh, Roberts rules, rules-driven, we mean well, a system doesn't work anymore. Because, you know, I was brought up through parliamentary procedures, a person of privilege, to understand that a, a vote of acclamation is a, we want to do this, we love you and everything, but it's like a flyover. Uh, I, I, when the, the folks are asking for conversation, and uh, this is not meant to be critical of you, I'm just a reflection on my part of how the system that we, I think we all yearn for is, is not the system we're working with because we need to find a way for people like me to understand better what's being said and get it beyond my white privilege rhetoric of support to something that's more like the sandpaper that uh, Nancy Led was talking about this one. So I, I just, I, want, I don't know, we don't want to withdraw the acclamation, but it's not satisfying because it's too easy for us. Thank you. So let's hear some uh, conversation about this. I, delegate, I recognize the delegate at the pro microphone. Hello, I'm Shafia Christos Rogers from the First Unitarian Church of New Orleans. And I stand to say that earlier, within the last half hour, we were reminded that um, we are all family. And that it is when we understand one another as family that, that we know we, if we shape our programs, if we do our work in a way to encourage and support that, then we might get somewhere at chinking away at this big rock of, of racism and other forms of oppression. And so I just want to say that I think it, this day calls us more than any to understand sometimes family has to school you. Sometimes we need to listen. Um, outside a sense of celebration and hurrahs, but to listen in a deep way and bring something, something that moves us at a deeper level. And as a white person, I'm standing up here with people who are my family, and I am part of something that's harming them through my whiteness in spite of any good intentions I've got. I am a part of doing harm by virtue of being a part of all these systems in this congregation and outside in our communities. And so I want us to hear this, 
hear this and take the time to listen this to these to the voices and do so from a place of the deepest kind of humility we can find and it may not be as deep as it needs to go but we can go a little deeper every day and this day is one of those days thank you I recognize the, dele the next delegate at the pro microphone. Sorry, I've got a procedure question. I recognize the delegate at the procedures microphone. Hi, Jim. Christina Rivera, um, your fellow trustee on the Board of Trustees. Um, I'm going to take a moment of personal privilege. Certainly. When this is passed, and I know it will be, I would like you, as our moderator, this beautifully written responsive resolution calls on the board to take action, right? Yeah. And that is really important that you are calling on us to do this work. And not just work, as Denny said, but conversation, right? To be in conversation that this isn't just about producing a report at the next three general assemblies, right? We are going to be in conversation, in community. We are going to do the difficult things as a board. It's calling on us to do the work. So when this is passed, I'd like an affirmation from you, our trusted leader, <laughs> that we are going to do this difficult work, that we hear the call, and that we are prepared to respond. Thank you. And let me assure you that when they brought me the business, the business resolution, we spoke at some length before this was uh, perfected, and I gave them that assurance. I recognize the delegate at the procedures mic. Jan Taddeo, serving our congregation in Lawrenceville, Georgia, and... Kevin Lowry from the Unitarian Universalist of Wayne County in Worcester, Ohio. We would like to ask if we could move into a committee of the whole and invite our, the group to come forward and... And speak from, the speak from the stage. Oh, I don't think we need a committee of the whole, if you don't mind. I think we can come to the stage. And however, uh, I'll invite However uh, you think we can do it and be effective. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part. However you think we could do <laughs> Thank it. You. Thank you. So I would invite the youth who penned this, organized it, talked to their blue siblings. I would invite you up to the stage, uh, either through the stairs. All in that scrum are invited. Everybody in the scrum is invited. I'll take it as a point of personal privilege to uh, give them the mic, uh, but I see that I have a delegate at the procedures microphone, so I recognize that delegate. Thank you. Uh, my name is Wesley Thompson. I'm from First Unitarian Universalist here in Columbus. And I would just like to ask uh, you, Mr. Moderator, uh, to remind us of something you've reminded us throughout the course of these debates, not to uh, assume in a particular attitude uh, that's being uh, uh, that to addressed or, or attached to uh, people in these discussions. Very good. Thank you. So let's be sure that we are um, um, honoring our uh, youth and young adults that are up here, as you can see, uh, standing together. Um, and I would like to invite whomever wishes just to speak at the microphone to just say something or anything or nothing at all or something. Okay. Come on down. Can we move over? You want to speak? You want to speak? Hi. You've got the crowd. Hi, I'm Sir LeBaire Jr. Sir LeBaire Jr. from the UU Church of Akron. My Reverend Tim uh, Temerson, really, you know, he encouraged me to come out here. Reverend Elizabeth Wen, she encouraged me to come out here. I've known Leslie Mack for about two years. 
I met her after I came back from Ferguson in August. I remember seeing a lot of UUs out there in yellow shirts. Where are those UUs? Where were they on Friday? I was brought out here to be in a, a safe space, share my workshop, spiritual healing. I didn't prepare anything, so. And it's just interesting to me that I was brought out here to this safe space because everybody's proud of me and my congregation put me on a committee, let me preach. And I'm brought out here. All these people are like, oh, you're so cool for fighting the system. We're all so cool. You're living vicariously through us. Because it's funny how you choose to fight a corrupt democracy and you use a corrupt democratic process to do it. It's funny to me how you say you appreciate us for fighting the system and you're the same system that now we are out here having to fight. I stand in front of sound cannons, rifles, dogs, and you think I won't stand in front of you and say this? I appreciate the concern that we got on Saturday morning, the $89,000 of African aid money that we now have to funnel through our middlemen to figure out how it gets to the parishioners in the congregations. We needed a public statement of support in front of our nation, our world, that this country was made great on the backs of slaves, that it's going to become great again by fighting that original problem, not four months of fighting Trump for the Democrats. I, bring my, I brought my family out here to be wounded, to hear about this betrayal. And now I have people, and we're, we have to stay, the youth wrote this. Where, where do, we adults, we should have written that. I'm not necessarily asking how we're going to move forward. One of my delegates at Akron told me that he was really sorry for the black people in our congregation and our community. I'm sorry for the UU as a tradition. We don't need the UU. We are already connected. We've been connected for two years and longer, for 400 years, fighting this, these kinds of systems. So I want proof of why I should stay. I want proof of why we should stay. I want something done. I don't know about this responsive resolution. I've been a UU for six years. I haven't heard about any delegate system. So my question is, to the system, what are we going to do? Not what are you going to say? Thank you. I'm Isis James Carnes from All Souls of New London. I'd like to share something that I wrote while I was here. You white folks are afraid of us because of the wrongs you did and do to us. You think we want to do the same to you, but you are wrong. All we want is equality, a chance in the economy, a safe place for our families. We want the things you have and keep from us. But this is what you need to understand. We are getting angrier, closer to snapping. And one day soon, who knows what will happen? Because then you'll become the enemy of the majority. Yeah, that's what I said. You white folks are the majority, are the minority, and we, the people of color, are the majority. Chloe Rush Spratt from First Universalist in Minneapolis. I, my family has been a member, a members of First Universalist for about four years now, and three of those years I've been a university student, so I haven't had much time to actually be a part of the church. But every summer I come home and I'm disheartened by the lack of diversity in my church. My church is very, I'm grateful to my church because it continues to speak out for racial justice and against injustices. But it, I feel very alone when I'm there. Then I was invited to come here. I had no idea what GA was. And I was invited by the BLUU. And without them, 
I would not be here. But I'm so grateful to be here because I have finally found a family among my black friends and people of color faces that I can feel spiritually a part of. Without them, I would have felt so discentered for the rest of this summer. And while I'm so grateful for them, I'm scared to go back home. I'm scared to be alone without them. And we want change. We want change in our administration and the board. The banner is great, but when I first saw that banner, I honestly kind of scoffed because I was like, <laughs> black lives matter, but there are no black lives in your church. <laughs> You're just saying it to yourselves. So once again, I stand with them, and I've never felt more a part of something until this weekend. And I'm really hoping that you will listen to us, and you will demand change. You'll demand change in the administration, in the bureaucracy of this, and really have faith in what Unitarian Universalists stand for, because we are Unitarian Universalists, and we believe in that. We believe in this faith and this spirituality, but we want it for everyone. I want it to be equal and fair and just. <laughs> Let me say that certainly the moderator hears you. I think the, uh, and that you need more than being heard. You've been heard. The moderator and the board, I haven't polled the whole board, but I have no doubt based on a couple of our trustees' comments uh, in the crowd. We hear your message, we will action it, and we will keep reporting on it. Um, I can't speak for the congregations. This work is yours to do. You've got to take this back to your congregations, this message. Have the people that didn't come here watch this, the video of this when you got back. Create a service out of it because the work has to be done at our congregations and our communities. So please do that for us, and we'll keep reporting on it. Thank you. But we have some uncompleted business to do. We have to pass this resolution. All those in favor, raise your card. Thank you. Opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Wow. Let's breathe with this for a moment. I've got to breathe with this for a moment. I thank the delegates for the response to all of this and the departure from protocol. I hope this is something going forward as we reimagine, uh, uh, renew our covenant and think about social justice uh, going forward, which uh, has been talked about several times this week. I hope you'll take, the, take advantage of responding to our asks to go into discernment in a different way as we go forward, beginning in New Orleans. Perhaps we can move in a more collegial in, uh, uh, direction of getting our work done and doing deep, deep work like this, which results in activity, not just motions. So thank you very much. Our next, um, the debate is closed, so we thank you for that. 
Um, we're going to New Orleans next June. Had you heard about that? So welcome, Jolanda Walker, to tell us why what place was you going to New Orleans? I mean, it's going to be hot. It's going to be humid. But it's going to be fun. Thank you. <sighs> Breathe in. Are we prepared for New Orleans? I hope so. Hello, I'm Jolanda Walter, and I have the pleasure of being your local arrangement chair for General Assembly in 2017. And I invite you all to the UUA's southern region, to a quiet little place in the Mississippi Delta called New Orleans. New Orleans writer and journalist Chris Rose says, you can live in any city in America, but New Orleans is the only city that lives in you. I invite you to come to one of the most unique cities in the world and experience how our city can live in you. Breathe in. The smell of freshly brewed cafe au lait in the morning. The sounds of brass bands calling your spirit to rejoice the roots of ancient live oak trees uplifting the sidewalks, the power and force of the mighty Mississippi shaping our beloved Crescent City and sculpting the high ground where our convention center resides. Breathe in our joyful hospitality and affection for simpler things. Challenge your palate with world-renowned cuisine that is prepared in a rue of history, ghosts, and tradition. Discover the many flavors of New Orleans, the food, the music, the architecture, the artistry, the history, the all-ages fun. It's spicy, it's sweet, it's earthy, it's rich, it's warm, it's intoxicating. New Orleans will leave its mark in you, and you will be affected, inspired, and transformed. And that which unite all of us you use that calls us to serve and fight for justice also unites New Orleanians in community and solidarity. So I invite you to come stand with us, to come roll with us, to come walk with us, to come dance with us, to get uncomfortable with us, and to listen to us. So let's make history together. I can't wait to see all of y'all in New Orleans. It's June 21st to 25th next year. And don't forget your open hearts, your taste buds, your dancing shoes, and your water bottle.
I can't wait. We now want to hear um, our last report from the Right Relationship team in the ever-present Lisa Bovey Kemper. And so our time together draws to a close. First of all, I need to apologize. I was careless with my words in my report this morning. When I said step, I could have said move or something else like that. I share this apology with you, first of all, because I am truly sorry. But I also share it because it is a reminder of the truth that there is no finish line for this work. We learn, we try, we make mistakes, we seek forgiveness, we make amends, and we try again. So I am sorry. Part of the work of the Right Relationship Team is to identify the general themes that come up at General Assembly. We have heard this week of youth feeling disenfranchised, concerns about inclusive language, people feeling unwelcome in various spaces, including this one, due to a marginalized identity such as race or class, as well as misgendering and other comments regarding the use of bathrooms by trans and gender nonconforming persons. In addition, microaggressions have been common across identities. Tensions were high around a number of issues brought before general session, particularly the business resolution and actions of immediate witness. None of these are new themes. We see them repeating year after year. This tells us that we need to keep learning, to keep trying, to keep allowing ourselves to be changed by our relationships with one another. Like our congregations, we want General Assembly to be a place where people can bring their whole selves, not leaving part behind to participate in this community. Reverend Nancy McDonald Ladd spoke so eloquently this morning about real fights and fake fights. Our hope as a team is that our work helps this gathered community engage more deeply in the real ones. Our hope is that a conversation that begins with hurt and misunderstanding ends with a recommitment to the difficult relational work of being in religious community. With gratitude, I wish safe travels to you all and see you in New Orleans. Thank you, Lisa. And we have, I guess, our final report um, from our secretary, Reverend Rob Eller Isaacs. Before I share the final it, credentials it, it, report. It's kind of a tepid response, don't you think? Well, I don't actually anticipate any response. I'm the secretary. Okay. In September of 2013, thank you, friends. In September of 2013, the General Assembly Planning Committee, in consultation with the board and the administration, created the Worship Arts Team. The Worship Arts Team works with the GA Music Coordinator to recruit the leaders for our worship services. The Worship Arts Team works with all of those worship leaders to create the powerful and beautiful, moving, inspiring, interconnected worship services that we enjoy at General Assembly. For all three years of its existence, the Worship Arts Team has been chaired by the Reverend Carolyn Paterno. As Reverend Paterno rotates off the team, we offer our deepest thanks for her leadership. Carolyn, are you here? 
Well, we'll make believe you're here, and thank you so much. In our ever-expanding outreach, we had a total of 154 off-site uh, registrations, uh, 104 congregations were represented in that group from 31 states. The total number of delegates attending here at the assembly in person is 10, uh, 1,088, representing 471 congregations from 46 states. The total registration here, uh, including 204 youth in the Youth Caucus. Yes, how about them? is 3,788. Thank you. And I will close with a haiku I've written for the occasion. <laughs> Announcements. Not so good in worship. There is a world outside this hall. <clears throat> As I was planning the business sessions of this uh, General Assembly, um, it occurred to me long ago that we were going to have issues to discuss that were going to put us in that holy sandpaper space. Um, and I'd ask on Thursday morning, you'll recall, the Reverend Rosemary Bray McNatt and the Reverend Lee Barker to sort of give us a setting, a, a theological grounding, if you will. And so I thought it appropriate to reprise them and do sort of a reflection um, and a closing of our work together. So I invite them back to the, their usual seats on the platform. Lee Barker, Rosemary Bray McNatt. All right, let me see if I can get up here. Do you have a hand? Yeah, I uh oh, that's not going to work. I'm going to stand. All right. I'm going to sit. That's going to work. My back's acting up. Sure, you don't want to use that yeah, step? I'm truly good. All right. So, it's been quite a few days, hasn't it? It really has. I did not want to raise you in fear of false memory, I did not want you forced to mask your joys and bind your eyes. What I wanted for you was to grow into consciousness. And did we grow into consciousness? How did we do together? I think if I uh, am paying attention to my body, my body tells me things are all churned up. Mm -hmm. My body tells me that this has been one of the more emotional general assemblies and the many that I've been to over the decades. Yeah. There is a sense that I have that we mm -hmm. did pretty well together, and yet there's a lot of stuff that's hanging. A lot. And I don't just mean issues, I mean there's a lot of stuff hanging emotionally too. Yeah. There really are three, I think, Rosemary, uh, provoking, for me at least, provoking issues that came before the assembly. Some were in formal session, some were in informal session. Uh, one is about the plight of uh, Palestinians and, and how we as a body address that plight. That's right. The other is whether or not we're embracing uh, uh, fully enough the, the, the call from Black Lives Matter. And then the third is the, how Unitarian Universalism is addressing sexual misconduct among its clergy. 
we've done pretty well, but we're in a place where I at least am still kind of churned up. I feel like this disconnect, there's a disconnect between our, our aspirations and our actions. And that disconnect is real. We all feel it. And if we hadn't felt it, the powerful witness of our youth around the Black Lives Matter movement this afternoon is a real reflection of that disconnect and the voices of our young people saying talk is cheap. And I resonate with that. I have young children. They're not children anymore, actually, they're young adults. But they were raised in this faith, and yet they are not here. And they're not here for the very same reasons that these young people describe. Um, so that disconnect is real. But what's also real, I think, is this sense of impatience, a kind of holy impatience which I think is also real. The energy that says talk is not enough anymore. The system as we understand it is not enough anymore. The faith that has sustained so many of us is no longer adequate for the needs of the day. And that is what I feel very strongly that's happening in here. Well, and balancing that holy impatience with what we know to be the holiness of relationship yeah. as well. You know, I, uh, I've spent some time in marriage counseling over the course of my life. <laughs> and maybe one of the most illuminating things that a therapist ever said to me in that context was, you know, Lee, you can be right all the time or you can be in relationship. That's right. Take your pick. That's right. That's right. Balancing how to be in relationship, how to giving up the need to be right, oh, that is spiritual work. It's hard, too. And what we've been asking of each other in here has been hard and will be hard. What you were asked to do this afternoon will be hard to take home because GA is just a stopping place where the work is triggered but is not really begun. It's identified, but the work begins when we go home. And so I think that it's more important perhaps even than our earlier ritual on Thursday to send people back home with a reminder of that same ritual, an encouragement to begin with that perhaps as you arrive back in your congregations and communities because the hard work is still ahead of you and ahead of me and ahead of you. And so I put my hand in yours so that we might do together what we cannot do alone. I put my hand in yours so that we might do together what we cannot do alone. We put our hands and the future of our movement in yours so that we might do together what we cannot do alone. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. We're almost ready to adjourn, but there are so many people to thank, and I need to look at my list. Because this is a list of thank yous you certainly don't want to uh, to, to, to miss naming someone. And I'm going to ask, I'm going to read them, not rapidly, but if you're in the group that I'm going to recognize and you're in the hall, please come to the platform so people can see, frankly, the mass of people that it takes to pull off these kinds of things each year. I want to name a few and make your way to the stage as, as you're willing, able, and available. Um, 
our chaplains, headed by the Reverend Jennifer Brooks, our right relations team, headed by Reverend Lisa Bovey Kemper. She has a co-chair, but he's had an emergency in the family, and he's been posting that on Facebook, but I'll leave you to go there to, to understand his situation. The UU Musicians Network, they're probably exhausted, but if they're still in the hall, Susan Peck and the many musicians that have brought so much energy and reflection to this gathering. Um, the GA uh, Conference Services staff, Jan Snegas, Don Plant, Stacy Dixon, Steve Ransom, the unknown, unseen people over there, the tech deck that respond to these last minute slides, <laughs> overnight texts, script changes, etc. They are the unsung heroes here. We need more people up here, people that are part of these organizations. Please come forward. Um, Meet Green, you probably haven't had much interaction with them. Ariet, uh, Aaron Elliott and, and our district coordinator, Laura Hound, here from in town. And she had 180 volunteers. If there are 108 of you in the room, come on up. CMI, Greg Bates and the team, the guys in black that are always moving stands and mics and cueing me, all great. The worship arts team, you've heard uh, Carolyn Paterno called out. The program development group that puts together all the workshops and gets the tracks going. Gail Forsyth Vale and Reverend Renee Richke, the co-chairs. The Commission on Social Witness, they work through the night to work through these, uh, particularly the uh, CSWs on Saturday to present them to you on Sunday. And last, and certainly not least, our seminary presidents, uh, Rosemary Bray McNatt and uh, Lee Barker, who I thought added a nice bookend to our, uh, our deliberations this weekend. And then Vice Moderator Denise Rimes and the Board of Trustees, I'm going to invite you up. And the hundreds of UUA staff from across the country that have led workshops and everything else. Pretty soon we're going to all be up here, and the few delegates that haven't gone home will be left in the hall. And finally, certainly but not least, President, Pres President you remember his name, Peter Morales, whose interfaith initiatives led to this first interfaith GA. I'm personally grateful uh, for the effort of all, and I hope a good GA for all of you. Yes? Well, let's wait for them to all get up here before I send you all home. Now, you're ready to take all that you've done this week home and put things into action. So we just haven't produced pieces of paper but some actionable items that we can energize our congregations in the work that is yet to do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll ask the vice moderator to come up and uh, read this motion. I'm sorry, the procedure might cannot open. I beg you, but, but if you want to get with the teller. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Denise? Why don't you move that we adjourn? I've known Jim Key for a while now, and I've always wanted to get up in public and not do what he says. <laughs> so before I do what he says, I would like to offer, on behalf of all of the volunteers, the Board of Trustees, and the many of you who helped make this a successful GA, I'd like to thank Moderator Key for what I've learned is an extraordinarily difficult job. You get up here in front of this teleprompter and you go, or this screen, and you go, who is that old lady at the microphone? <laughs> Wait, it's me. So at any rate, I'd like to move that this General Assembly is now adjourned. So it has been moved and seconded that this General Assembly is now adjourned. All those in favor of adjournment, please signify by raising those voting cards. Thank you. And we'll wait for the off-site delegates. And I thank the off-site delegates. I think the technology went better. Thank you. Those opposed to adjourning?
The motion, the motion to adjourn is carried, and I declare that the 2016 General Assembly of the Unitarian Universalist System Association now stands adjourned. Have a wonderful summer. See you in New Orleans, y'all.
Um, my name is Elandria Williams. I'm a delegate from Tennessee Valley U Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, a place where the standing on the side of love came from because of a church shooting and a place where a church burning happened this week. They are completely, completely connected. Somebody in my church was shot and killed. Some Jake Morrill, who a lot of you know, Sister wrote a piece that was really beautiful around why this matters and why we as a faith community have to stand with people regardless because we know what it means to go through this just as much as everybody else. So me as a person who is black, identified, who is also a UU and a proud one at that, need you to support us and everybody else because we do believe in the hair and worth and dignity of every person, which, me believes, which means we believe that black lives matter, that our children matter, that our families matter, and that all of us, black people's bodies are sovereign, just like all of us want our bodies to be as well. So if you actually want to stand with all of us, including the people in this hall who need you, please vote for this, vote for this amendment, vote for this action, and take action today at 4.30 out in front of this place because in Portland right now, they're on a decree because they are doing shooting here too. So stand with the people in Portland and stand with the people in this assembly.
Good evening. Good, good evening. Good evening. We are honored to be here with you. And I just want to note that Tamir Rice would have been 14 today. And I imagine what his mother is wrestling with now. But I come from a tradition that even in the midst of trouble and tribulation, we still say hallelujah. And so will you just, as we go into this other song, but will you just say this with us? say that No matter where you are, no 
Dr. John Gilmore. I'm a minister, retired minister, still doing work in wellness and social justice. I'd like to welcome all of you here tonight. Hi, everyone. My name is Ashley Boyd, and I'm from Chicago, Illinois. <laughs> And I'm very happy to be here with you all today. Thank you. I'm Isis James Carnes from New London, Connecticut, and I'm also very happy to be with you guys today. We are all Unitarian Universalists. We light our chalice today in celebration of our journey together this past week, of our ability to harness love's power, to end oppression, and of the road that lies before us. May the flame we light now remind us of the power, beauty, and fragility of our lives. In the ongoing struggle towards freedom for all, Ella's song was composed by Varnice Johnson Reagan, the founder of the black women's vocal ensemble Sweet Honey in the Rock. It is named after Ella Baker, a highly re revered adult advisor of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, also known as SNCC. She said, remember, we are not fighting for the freedom of the Negro alone, but for the freedom of the human spirit, a large freedom that encompasses all mankind. She also said, until the killing of black men, black mother's sons becomes as important as the killing of white mother's sons, we who believe in freedom cannot rest until this happens. Courage when we fail 
and if I can but shed some light as they carry us through the veil. The older I get, the better I know that the secret of my going on is in the reins or in the hands of the young who dare to carry us through the storm. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. Oh, we who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Not needing to touch for power. Will you just repeat after me? I can hear my neighbor crying, I can hear my neighbor crying. Saying, I can't breathe. saying I can't breathe. And now I'm in the struggle, saying I can't leave. We're calling out the violence of the racist police, and we ain't going to stop. Until the people are free. Until the people are free. Choir, will you help me out? We all please stand and help me out. We all please stand. <laughs> People 
Good afternoon, GA. I'm so honored to have this opportunity to speak with you today, but I have a confession to make. I was all set to deliver an address I wrote over a month ago. Those GA deadlines are very, very real. But I woke up, like we sang about in worship this morning, with freedom on my mind and a new message in my heart. So my friends, can I share it with you this morning? This week was my first General Assembly experience and it's been truly amazing. It's been a week of joy and pain, of connection and separation, of new faces and old friends. General Assembly 2016 for me, like life, has been a lesson in contradictions. Mm. This actually makes perfect sense because our faith is a lesson in contradictions. Right? We see contradictions in the wave of Black Lives Matter banners being hung in our congregations around the country, and yet, in truth, Many black UUs feel unwelcome in our pews. We see contradiction in the historic Black Lives of UU collection yesterday in this whole hall proclaiming Black Lives Matter, and yet this body delivered a no vote for divestment this week. We see this in a GA planning committee who wholeheartedly supported our request for an explicitly black healing space, and yet the need for that space exists at all amongst our people. My friends, there's a disconnect. I said there is a disconnect. And we need to get it together. We must be transformed. There's a disconnect between the work we want to do and the way we go about doing it between our principles and our actions, between our words and our deeds. And we really need to get it together. We must be transformed. Over the last few years, so many white UUs have come up to me and said, Leslie Mack, how can we show up for black lives? My response is always the same. I say, well, it's really simple. You just show up and then you show up again, and again, and again, and you keep doing it until it becomes a habit for you in your life. <laughs> until the effects of your words and actions on communities of color become something you think about before you say and do them and not after until including black voices in your search for truth become as comfortable as the white voices that you're used to, until the spiritual lives of black people in your communities are considered in every single decision you make as a congregation. This brings us to the question that looms large for us as a people of faith. In the face of a global movement demanding action towards black liberation, how can we be transformed? How can our faith be transformed? This work towards collective liberation is more than just about outcomes. How we do this work is also how we create the world that we want to see. The second principle of black lives says love and self-love is practiced in every element of everything that we do. Love must be the driver of our work and an indicator of its successes. Without this principle and without healing, 
we will harm each other and undermine the movement we are building together. So we can no longer cause emotional harm to people of color as we did at last year's Black Lives Matter AIW in the Assembly Hall, and then return to General Assembly 12 months later to claim that action as victory. We can no longer do things the way they've always be done and then ask why change is taking so long. Mm. Quite frankly, my friends, we can no longer fail to take collective action as a faith and still call ourselves a movement at all. If we as a faith are truly committed to transformation, then I say to you, change must come to Unitarian Universalism. Mm. The way we have always done things must change. The way we seek connection must change. The way we move in the world must change. The way we worship must change. The way we breathe must change. So I ask you today, if you are personally committed to black liberation, do you consistently live that out? If your congregation is committed to black liberation, does it consistently make decisions in alignment with that commitment? And if our faith is truly committed to black liberation, are we finally ready to consistently challenge the long-held systemic practices that do not live up to that commitment? Only when we are able to answer those questions with a definitive yes will we truly be collectively transformed into the faith that we claim to be, into a faith we strive to be, into a faith that lives up to our principled belief in the dignity and worth of all people. Let us make that commitment to be consistent in our lives, in our congregations, and in our faith to say unapologetically with actions and not just words that black lives, they matter here. Thank you and blessed be. One of the most powerful ways the church offers us an opportunity to be one with another is through the power of music. David Frazier wrote a song he calls, I Need You to Survive. And I'd like to say that as we endeavor to be a community standing together, affirming the worth and dignity of black lives, we must enter the songs of black lives with humility, curiosity, and first, we must endeavor consciously to resist the temptation to colonize it with the changes <laughs> with the changes that make us more comfortable inside of it. If we can be present to black faith and black faiths, then in solidarity we might enter into the blessed relationship that allows us to deserve to be called allies. In this sense, Sing this song with me with curiosity, with humility, and with joined faith.
this body stand with me agree with me we're all on of God's body it is his will that every need be supplied you are important to me I need you to survive you are important to me I need you to survive I need you you need me we are all Stand with me, agree with me, we're all a part of God's body. It is His will that every need be supplied. You are important to me. I need you to survive. Listen, I pray for you, you pray for me, I love you, I need you to survive, I won't harm you with words from my mouth, I love you, I need you to Let's sing together. I pray, you pray for me. I love you. I need you to survive. I won't harm you. With the words from my mouth. I love you. I need you to survive. I pray for you. You are important to me. You are important to me. I need you to survive. Tell two more people, I, you are important to me.
Amen. Coming up here, River. <laughs> We're not singing, but you can come up here if you want. So, I like you. All righty. So, I didn't know what I was going to say because this has been a hard week on lots of lots of levels. And but what helped was what happened right before this, but right before we closed business and we came back to worship. So my first DA was 20 years ago. I was 16 years old and I came from a pretty amazing church. This little church called Tennessee Valley is kind of incredible. We kind of incredible, y'all. That's why there's so many ministers and y'all reach are just amazing rad folks all over the place. And my congregation always told me that I was amazing, powerful, and important. Both that one and Mount Zion Baptist Church, because without going to a black Baptist church or some black church, you might not know where you come as a black person. That's for me. So I needed both, and I got both. But my church always told me that I was loved. And then I came to my first general assembly. And I was like, oh, snap. I walk in the room, and these two girls are like, guess what? I was like, oh, what? They're like, we got some folks, because it's Indianapolis, right? So it's the big UGA. So we were real smart back then and put like 600 youth in one hotel with no adults. It was real smart. <laughs> real smart. <laughs> real smart. Uh, we had a good time, though. We took over the steak and shake. So, and we were pretty powerful young people. But what I remember is the sheer amount so I, the, the first thing I encountered was two white boys that decided to call themselves Kareem and Abdul and decided to dress and act like they were black, what they thought was black. That was my first encounter at General Assembly. And I went, oh, we have already started on the bad foot. And it got progressively worse and worse and worse. And if it wasn't for Kristen Harper, and Joseph Santos Lyons, who called us in to a youth and young adult of color space, I would never be back. And then Joseph called me back in again. And so I'm gonna stand in here and say my piece, but I also can't stand here without acknowledging the legacy in which I come from. So I'm staring at Mel Hoover over there, and Miss Mama Thea over here, and Denise, and there's then Hope, and there's so many more that we could go on for days. But people I met when I was 14 and 15 who changed my life in more ways than I know how to count. And they taught me what it truly meant to be with white people. Not back home, right? Because back home, white people who are on the good foot be doing the work. They just real. They don't say stupid stuff. Because the ones that do, you be like, oh, uh-uh, we ain't doing that. Because we had Confederate flags in my high school. So I didn't come from a pretty happy, cute place. They were very clear in Tennessee what they liked and didn't like. So all the like liberal nicety is strange, right? I'm like, you very obvious. And so those folks were like, they went through the work. They sent with, we went through, we did journey to our wholeness. We did transformation teams. I was the youngest person on district transformation team by like 20 years. And then I got called back to do work with Concentric and opus with young adults, where I met Mr. Matt Marva here and other people, and the youth work. And they fed my life and my soul. And then this thing happened in Fort Worth, Texas, that we don't like to talk about as a faith, but I've decided that I don't care anymore. Because one day you get to tell your truth. Even when people try to hide it. Someday you get to be up here with the mic and tell your truth. 
So I watched my young people, and I call them mine, because damn it, they mine. Be in a church that locked its doors on them. Be in a church that called the police on them. Be in a church that when the shower broke, said, go outside and bathe yourself with the water hose. So when people go, I don't understand. It's like, for real, why don't you get it? Y'all did it. So then we come to General Assembly, and I tell some people that we're in the highest leadership positions there are. This is what happened. And they said, oh, and didn't listen. And then, of course, because it's General Assembly, more and more stuff happens until there's a blow up over time. And then what do we call a name tag commission? And so one of my best friends who wasn't even here got put on a thing that I call the name tag commission. Because except for us saying what actually happened, we said, well, you know, if you just had your name tag on, then you would have been all right. And didn't worry about why the white people could come in with no name tag, but just said, oh, the name tag commission. And so in 1996, when crazy stuff went down, we didn't get to come on stage when I was a youth. In 2000, it was at five. When that went down, nobody was allowed to come on stage. When groundwork was defunded, and so now we have no youth and young adult anti-racism work happening in a really large sense of way, especially for white people, which is why you have some of the most amazing ministers and DREs and organizers in this country by far. No one stood up. Now here we are in 2016. And so someone asked, is change possible? 10 years ago, I would have told you me and Bill Sinkford would not have stood on this stage next to each other, fighting for a Black Lives Matter initiative, because I'm just going to be real right now. But I stand with that man just a minute ago to say, where are we now? Where are we now? That would not have happened 10 years ago. What you just saw would not have happened 10 years ago. Some of it's because of relationships, because I met Jim Key a long time ago. But I want to say that all of it can't just be about relationships. We have spent a lot of our time here talking about we have to build relationships, and we have to go past divisions, and we need to unify, which is nice except for one problem. That doesn't actually deal with the problem. Do we understand what I'm saying? Unification is not my problem. I need my twin to not have to worry about paying bills. Do you hear what I'm saying? Paying bills. I need my friends to not be shot at and locked up. I need police to not sexually harass me, right? I need my folks in West Virginia to not have died two days ago because of flooding, because the U.S. government does not give a damn about West Virginia. Sandy got a whole bunch of money because it's New York and New Jersey. South, irrelevant. So what I'm saying to us is that we both have to sit here and say, how do we stand together and unify, of course, and how do we use our leverage, our money, our time, our resources, our positionality to shift this world? Can you do that for me? Shift this world. So here's what we're going to do, but I think my time is up, who remembers? is there's a chant that we're going to close with. Um, because I learned a long time ago in juvenile incarceration work, juvenile justice work, just say it. I also want to offer this one wish. The next time we do an offering, pay attention to who you're giving the money to. Are you giving it to a radical organizing group that can't get paid? that is led by people of color and most directly impacted communities? Are we giving it to service organizations that are run by white people that can give money anytime they want? Who are we putting our dollars behind? I don't care about your words, I care about your money in the end of the day. Are we investing in black infrastructure? 
HBCUs. We used to do that. Are we doing that now? So if you stand as you are willing and able, because we're going to do a chant, and then they're going to go. So I need you to stand up, if you can. I know it's hard. So here we go. We're going to go low, then high. Come here. Come here, Seiko. I've known you way too long. Come on. Wait, wait, too long. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and protect one another. We have nothing to lose but our chains. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and respect one another. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Now I need you to think about Tamir Rice, Martez, and the 22 young people I lose almost every year. I almost committed suicide twice this year because I am tired. Tired. And I cry almost every damn day because I am going through actual people problems in the places where I work. So I need you to go through actual people problems and your communities with me. Because otherwise we ain't gonna win. You cannot be liberated as it is tattooed on my wrist if we don't do it together. So one more time, because I need you to be my church. Don't tell me anymore, thank you for being here. This is my faith, mine. I got here in the third grade because I chose it. Not when I was 25, not as a minister, I chose it. There are youth that were born and raised here. It's theirs, damn it. So I need you to hold. When it is ours, don't tell us that you were being here. Because it ain't just yours. It is mine. So if you can't be my faith, then guess what? You might need to find another one. Because it's mine. So I want it to be all of our faith. So the next time you see a person of color or you, don't you ask them. Don't say thank you for being here. Say thank you for welcoming me in. Because we welcomed you in. I am tired. So I am saying this because nobody wants to actually kill their born and raised you youth. We broke them by the wayside. I run into folks every single day that are Unitarian Universalists and they don't count. We got people running the best organizing groups in the country. Best in the country. You see white young people? I guarantee you that you, you. And they don't come to church. And they're not, not here. Enough. So you don't need speakers that are you, you. Bring the old ones back. If you don't know them, ask somebody else. Because they are doing amazing, powerful, movement work that can transform our soul, our hearts, our minds, and our spirits by any means possible. By any means possible. So please, dear God, work with me. Because this is my faith, and yes, I'm a little universal Christian. That's where I was raised, I'm from the South. So you just gotta hold that on, it'll be all right. So here we go, one more time. And we're gonna sing it, we're gonna say it so loud. So, so, so very loud that our ancestors can hear us. That the generations that come after us can hear us. Are you ready? And I want to say this too. You don't have to be a minister to be a preacher. You don't have to be a minister to do faith work. We don't need everybody going to ministry of school. Do the work. Go out in community and do that work. So I'm tired. Don't ask me anymore if I'm going to become a minister. I am one. Hey. Are we ready? Hey. One more time. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and protect one another. We have nothing. We have nothing. We have nothing. To lose. To lose. But.
and the Local Arrangements Chair for GA 2017. On behalf of the lay people and the clergy of Greater New Orleans, Louisiana, I will extinguish this chalice, grateful for our time together and the struggle that continues in great anticipation, in great anticipation for our gathering next year. May we go in peace, assured that love surrounds us everywhere we may go.
to fight for our freedom. It's our duty to win. We must love and support each other. We have nothing to lose but a chance. I believe, 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 I believe.
you, God bless you. My name is Reverend Seku. This is Jay Marie, the Holy Ghost. Our band members you, are rushing out. Take the work. Back Love y'all. Thank you. Thank you, choir. I think you can get CDs of ours in the back. God bless you. We love you, UUA.